Welcome to Beyond the Press Release with Professional Gore Coleman, which we take the time to speak with small cap executives about recent important developments and news in layman's terms at their companies. With us today, I'm really happy to have again James Briscoe. He's CEO, President, and Chairman of the Board at Liberty Star Uranium. The company trades on the stock symbol LBSR. You can find them on the web at libertystaruranium.com or almost more importantly, over at Agoracom, where you can actually post your questions get your answers and have great civilized discussion with fellow shareholders. Uh, the company uh, the other day put out a press release regarding the Haymountain project uh, and uh, the release and the requirement of a native plant survey. And here to talk more about that is James Briscoe. James, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Glad to have you back. Uh, these are a big hit with all the, uh, with all the shareholders. So we figured why not keep uh, communicating this way? Well, we have got lots of responses that I'm happy to answer any reasonable questions. So here we go. All right. So you're gearing up for uh, uh, for actual exploratory drilling, uh, hopefully of porphyry, copper, gold, molly, and other associated metals uh, at Hay Mountain. And as a result, you've been putting out some news, and this is this is the latest one here. Um, so why is this survey important as part of the permitting process? Well, we're dealing with ranch land that's actually been ranch land for well over a hundred years back going back to the 1880s when the Apaches were more or less uh, quelled a bit but still not uh, completely removed and <clears throat> so the uh, the state land uh, is comprises actually a high percentage of this particular area unusually high percentage and they're very concerned with the vegetation there as it relates to cattle grazing. So when we talk about putting in roads and setting up drill sites, they are concerned about that. Although every time we pick up a sample, we take a picture of that sample and also where it was from and a picture facing north, south, east, and west. We have a lot of documentation on everything that we've done there, but uh, we actually submitted that to their plant specialist, and that plant specialist said, oh my heavens, there's a lot of forbs out there, in which case we said, what? Uh, so <clears throat> we'll give a definition of what a forb is. But yeah, what, what is a forb? Why are those, uh, well, yeah. are those important? That, that was uh, new to me, even though I'm a native uh, Arizonan, and actually my family grew up in this uh, area. But I'm going to read what a forb is, because I didn't know what it was. A forb, F-O-R-B, which is sometimes spelled P-H-O-R-B, is a herbaceous flowering plant that is not gramoid, which means grasses, sedges, and rushes. The term is used in biology and in vegetation ecology, which is what we're concerned with, especially in relation to grasslands and understory. <clears throat> so, now you know what a forb is, and I kind of get it, but I'll be interested to see what what forbs we've been walking around. We don't trample things, but <laughs> we walk so around them. How long do you expect that uh, you know that part of the process to take? Uh, the specialist has been uh, contracted, and he's got an opening later this month or uh, the following uh, in in November. It's not much later on this month. I guess it's early next month, and it's only going to take a couple of days. So it's quick, <clears throat> but the state land department reserves the right to take between 60 and 90 days to return this. So we have to get this underway so that all of these permits hit uh, at the right time to get the drill actually on the ground. So we have to have the drilling permit, the road permits, which we've got archeological permit, and uh, the, now the vegetation permit. And that's the last in a series of permits. So this is quite laborious and it's, uh, it's tedious because you have to make all of the time frames 
of a whole bunch of people that we can't necessarily control and the state land uh, all uh, can congeal at the same time so that we get our permits done and we can go to work. So let's talk about the timeline here um, because you did state you did state in the press release that uh, I'm reading here you expect uh, there should be no permitting delays so what does this do for the January timeline expectations? Well we're, we're going to be within that although since they have stated in their regulations that they have 60 to 90 days it's conceivable that some permits might be let in 60 days and will be held up for another 30 days by the 90 day uh, time frame but this this vegetation survey is quite a simple survey and we don't think that it should be much of a problem but that's our perception so we'll we are at the beck and call of the Arizona State Land Department so in the meantime, what are next steps for Liberty Star? Well, we will be doing some more reconnaissance work using the X-ray fluorescence unit to see whether there are more outcrops of the high-grade green copper oxide. Uh, and <clears throat> we still have a bit of area to look at that we have not uh, crawled over intently. So we will work, be working on that. And then uh, we had earlier announced that we were looking for some quick to get into production precious metal deposits and uh, perhaps uranium deposits. And we have subverted those to be sure that we got, once we found the high grade Gaussian outcrops at Hay Mountain, that really switched that into the highest priority. So we will continue working on the other targets uh, while we're waiting for the permits for Hay Mountain and we do have some encouragement in those areas but still more work to be done. Now uh, I'm going to finish off with this note. We, this is the third interview we've done in, uh, in just under a week. They've, uh, they've had great reception so we want to continue using this this mode of communicating with shareholders uh, as the company puts on more and more updates. But you may have to go into a quiet period. So uh, uh, if you could just kindly give everyone a little co a little color on that so that they don't think that we've uh, we've gone you know hardcore with these and all of a sudden we fall off we fall off the video the, the video face. Yes. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we're in the uh, process of some financing uh, machinations, and the SEC requires that for their own <clears throat> reasons which are a little bit hard to understand that we have a quiet period where we don't talk about anything for uh, 30 days so we have to observe that quiet period and therefore we can't do this type of discussion for that period so we haven't disappeared it's just that we are under a stipulated quiet period stipulated by the SEC all right, Jim, as always, I want to thank you again for taking the time out to, to talk to everybody. It's important for everyone to understand, uh, you know, all these little steps and how they fit into the grand picture of the uh, of the January timeline. So it's, it's always appreciated and thank you for, for, for joining us. Let me add just one thing here, George. Sure, of course. <clears throat> we think uh, a long ways ahead, and because we believe that we're going to discover or an ore body or ore bodies of some size that we can't know until we get the drilling completed. But I have designed what I call the Briscoe Noceum Mine, and I presented this to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in uh, 2006 related to our North Pipes projects, where uh, there was a lot of pressure that actually ended up in having uh, to the president to withdraw the area uh, entirely for 20 years, which pretty much puts it out of anybody's interest range. Regard regardless, uh, these uh, this uh, approach to an invisible mine is applicable any place on Earth, and what it really does it is allows us to first build the uh, overburden 
dumps so that they can seal the mine, including all equipment and all operations, within um, a, a circular uh, dump area. And then, because nowadays we can very carefully plan on how <clears throat> much uh, how much room will be required for overburden and other facilities. Uh, all that will take place interior and the exterior of the uh, pile of uh, overburden will be immediately remediated and replanted and it will be at a low angle so that uh, so that cows and other things can walk on it without problems. And as the mine approaches exhaustion with the last load of ore, the last amount of material will go onto this uh, dump uh, area. <clears throat> I hate to call it a dump area. That's uh, actually pejorative. But this pile of existing soil and rock that came from the same area that we were working on uh, will be completely rejuvenated and we will plant the last plants and it will be done with. During the mine's life, you will see no mine, you will see, um, have no wow. dust, you will see no light, you will hear no noise, and it will look just like any of the other hills and mountains in the area that we'll be working in. And unless you fly over it in a helicopter, you're simply not going to see anything except vehicles going into what it appears to be a hill and disappearing and then coming out and the community will get lots and lots of cash flow from all the good things that big mines bring to communities with no pollution, no aesthetic change, uh, and just positive stuff. Well, Jim, so, I got to tell you, even that, that caught me by surprise. That, that on its own deserves a full interview at some point in the future because that's that's no small potatoes. That's pretty big stuff that you're able to uh, pull that off, especially in the state of things the way they are now, where those environmental concerns are extremely important uh, in the success of a mining project and, and, and how much uh, support it gets from both government and, and, local, and local people. Well, this was a good entree to it, but I did when I did present it to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, one uh, gentleman came up to me and said, Mr. Briscoe, I've been coming to these things for 33 years, and that is the most uh, far-reaching and most exciting thing I've seen since in those 33 years. So it is drastically important, and it gets rid of all the objections to uh, mines, whether they're underground or open pit. Well, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say we're glad you're on our side. <laughs> Of course. Thanks, Jim. You've been watching James Briscoe. He's a CEO, President, Chairman of the Board at Liberty Star Uranium. You can find him on the web at libertystaruranium.com or on Agoracom by searching up Liberty Star Uranium. And as always, they trade on the stock symbol LBSR. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Goodbye.